Hello, welcome to KubeCon. So you're in the deep dive session for the CNCF serverless working group. Cloud Events was the first uh, big project that we've uh, actually had. So we have two items for you today. There's gonna be a demo, a deployment pipeline presented by me, and then Clemens is gonna be presented. Yes, I will be talking about some architectural considerations and things that we um, haven't done, won't do, and might do later. So let's get into the demo. Okay, first of all, I uh, built this demo for Amazons. They do video conversion in the cloud. Instead of having a video be transcoded in a movie, transcoded in hours or days as being done in minutes, cloud, very nice. Uh, they also have another product which is um, a streaming, delivering video to your end users. Everybody's building their own streaming service right now, so this is helping a lot with that. And they just announced the Frame DNA, which is AI for video. If you have multiple versions, say a version that censored and a version that does not censor, this helps a lot with managing this. Amazons was and is a startup. And as a startup, they, the biggest focus is delivering a lot of features fast to get feedback from your customers, to improve and to validate your market use. Fortunately, uh, they've had great success, and that means that now they do have a, a paying customers. They have to focus on reliability. So they need to do that whole switch from, yes, we're building fast, we're breaking stuff, to, okay, we're building fast, but we are focusing on reliability. We're focusing on the customer experience. So to help with this, what we thought we would do is a deployment pipeline. That's something that was missing. We kind of have something right now which is working, but it is not ideal. Where we want to go is we want to have a fully observ observable uh, deployment pipeline. So if something fails at any stage in the pipeline, we want to know about it. We don't want to spend hours looking through logs, switching contact between GitHub, Circle, CI, other tools to see where a build fail or where a deploy is down. Also, working with video, they need to adhere to a lot of uh, compliance standards. MPAA uh, is an example, and those are very strict. So the whole deployment pipeline needs to be very, very auditable, and it needs to have steps like, okay, somebody needs to approve this deployment going to a client environment manually. Also, from a development perspective, this needs to be fast, and it needs to be scalable. Building developer environments at the start of every day, there's obviously going to be a lot of deploys, and at night, just a couple. And having this scale for this would be absolutely perfect, as we don't want it to be slow in any way, as that would impact velocity. So we started thinking about, OK, how should we build this? Obviously, the first step is getting um, data from GitHub. All our source, our source code is hosted in GitHub. And GitHub has a new realized feature, which is called webhooks. And they send you a webhook, a big JSON, containing everything that's happening in your repo. Say you just push the commit. To have this be as full tolerant as possible and as reliable as possible, we don't want to have just a single point that we ingest events from. What we have here, if I get this pointer to work, is GitHub is sending the event to an SNS which is a message queue for all my delegates, and then other queues subscribe and duplicate the messages. They duplicate these events, and they can each work independently. They can only subscribe to some events that they care about. I only care about issue comments. I don't care about commits, because I'm a bot that does GitHub issue automation stuff. It's pretty much the same thing for Circle CI. When a build is done, where a test has failed, I want to know I might be interested in different events in different types of events. <coughs> oh, sorry. So this is what we came up for. It's the proof of concept and the demo that we'll be presenting today. There are the SNSs that I just spoke about, the um, uh, Circle CI and GitHub SNSs. They all send their events to a Lambda, which records them in a DynamoDB table. This DynamoDB stream, if you're not familiar with it, uh, think of it as store procedures, but more powerful. Each time there is a um, line change in DynamoDB, you get notified and you can uh, run Lambda, you can forward it to wherever you want to do anything with it. 
how this is gonna work. The, uh, the uh, GitHub event is gonna be first. It's gonna go to a Lambda that's gonna put it in DynamoDB. Uh, an event is gonna go from DynamoDB to uh, the other Lambda, and this is gonna say, okay, this is not ready to be promoted. This is the promoter Lambda because we don't have an image yet. A little while after, the circle CI event is gonna get triggered. It's gonna go into DynamoDB. It's gonna go into the stream. The Lambda is gonna say, okay, I have an image. I can deploy this. It's gonna put the um, a message with, hey, please deploy this for me into another SNS, which is gonna be picked up by Lambda and deployed to EKS using help. So let's talk a bit about this. This is the first step. <coughs> and it's GitHub. This is what we would be interested in GitHub. We wanna know the repo, what app is this happening for? We wanna know what branch we're on, Master branch might have different uh, promotion requirements uh, as compared to, say, a release branch. You want to know the commit. We're gonna put, uh, we want to know that the build is not done. And as I said, for tracing, we want to have full visibility. Uh, we found out that the best tool for this is Honeycomb. So this is the data that Honeycomb needs to propagate a trace. So GitHub, <coughs> the GitHub Lambda, the GitHub event is gonna go to a Lambda, which is gonna put all this data into DynamoDB. Sounds good. The Circle CI event then is gonna come and it's gonna mark the build as true. The build was successful, the build was done. If this event doesn't ever come, okay, it's clear the build failed. We can see that very clearly in the trace. We can see where the issue was. Obviously, these is just, this is just a demo, so there are just two data sources, Circle CI and GitHub. You can add as many as you want. What the, <coughs> what the promoter Lambda does, it, it checks if they are true. You can do whatever you want here. So you can check, hey, do I have approval for legal? Do I have the static code analysis? Do I have the security check? Do I have everything I need in here? There's a sponsor version. <laughs> there are a lot of other tools you can integrate in that as a startup especially, you want to be able to integrate easily, fast, and to be able to plug them in and take them out as it's needed. <clears throat> okay, so this is the whole image. Let's go over it again. GitHub sends stuff, goes DynamoDB, Circle CI builds, goes DynamoDB, is deployed to EKS. Now we know what we want to build. We know like what the data flow will be, what events will be generated, and how we'll be acting on those events. So now we <clears throat> now we gotta do event design. We want to see what events are flowing to the system and how we're designing them. So what do we need? We need the event type. We need the source. Is it GitHub or is it CircleCI? We need a branch and we need a uh, git commit shell. OK, but we also want a header. And it's a trace header, which is terrible. It needs to be serialized. It needs to be deserialized. It needs to be taken care of. And as soon as we got to this place, we were like, okay, building our own JSON, our own data structure might be a bit too much. We don't want to do that. But hey, we know about Cloud Events. Cloud Events has the exact structure and it enabled us to very easily uh, put our data and not be concerned about it at all. Cloud Events is not making any assumptions about your actual event data. It's just metadata that goes ar around the event. You can put whatever you want in your data so you can go as well as you can. This is just helping with routing. So do you wanna know if there was a build success? You can just yeah, subscribe to this event. Do you wanna alert or have a special automation for failed builds? You can just subscribe to the <coughs> You can just subscribe to the events you're interested in. So let's go through the demo. First of all, special thanks to Elena, who actually wrote uh, a lot of the code. Let's go through the demo. This is not gonna die. Okay, the internet was not helpful. We have a simple Python app, which says, hey, KubeCon Europe, which is very nice, but this is not KubeCon. This is KubeCon plus Cloud Native Con, so let's change that. And we just committed this. What happens right now is we're going through that whole pipeline 
that I showed before. We're going through that whole level. GitHub sent a webhook to the Lambda. The Lambda is forwarding it. Circle CI has been triggered and is building this. If I go to Circle CI, and if the internet works, I can see that the build is running. Meanwhile, let's see the, what's happening with the traces. <coughs> can you see that kind of fish? Okay, so we can see that we uh, our event got into the GitHub automation part. We did validate the GitHub signature. We did validate the secret. This is a genuine GitHub event. We generated the cloud event. We can even see it. We've attached it as context. It's base64 encoded, but it is there. And then we went into the handle GitHub event part. We read the previous cloud event which was generated. We created our DynamoDB table, which was the one above. And you can see somewhere to here, circle CI build done is false because it's not ready. We wrote that to DynamoDB, and the promoter Lambda got in and checked, checked for promotion. And we have our error, error type, promotion failed. Why? Circle CI build not done. So the circle build is still happening. Looks like it is done. So let's, I'm not gonna refresh that by hand because I know it's acting weird. Come on, open. Okay, what? There is a missing span somewhere. I don't see it, but okay. So uh, in here we can see the full trace why I uh, spoke earlier about the level of, of observability that we are very, very much interested in. So, oh, this is the span that's missing, okay. So we read the cloud, we got, uh, why is this? Apologies. It looks like some events did not get sent. They did. Uh, the Lambda flushes the events at the end, and most likely it was, it, it was still deploying the Helm chart, so that's why it wasn't ready. So let's look through all this now that we have everything. So automation promoter check for promo promotion. Promotion failed. This is where we were before. It waited, it waited. The circle CA event came in. The promoter function ran again based on the DynamoDB stream. It checked for promotion. It saw that, that's okay, so it created and sent the, the cloud event further away. And then we got into the um, help install automation. <coughs> this also read the event. It did some preparing. Uh, we are uh, in a Lambda using Helm. We are authenticating to EKS, which is, is the IAM, uh, AWS IAM authenticator. So we need to do quite a lot of stuff for that. We install the authenticator, we validate that it's installed, that we have access to it, so if there's any issue with our Lambda, we do wanna know about it. We're preparing for Helm, we'll anything, we'll, we are adding our repo, which is using the Helm S3 plugin, which is amazing, and I highly recommend. We even get the output, so if there is an issue, say, we mistakenly changed the bucket policy and this Lambda is no longer allowed to access it. We will be able to see that here. And then we do the install so we have the whole output. And if we go to the curl that has been running in the background, you can see, hey, uh, kubecon plus cloud native con Europe, which is exactly the new commit. And the pods that are running in any case are all around two minutes old, so this all happened between the demo. The deploy was fully automated, it was very visible, it was clear, and it was very, very fast and scaling super fast. This also allowed us and encouraged us. This is a lot how I've seen serverless used as uh, when you're doing lambdas and serverless, you are forced to uh, invest heavily in observability. You cannot SSH into a Lambda, <laughs> you cannot do that. You can get the Lambda to SSH back to you, but don't do that. And uh, being forced to properly instrument the applications, to properly get visibility into it, is exactly what Amazon wants to add to its old products and what we've been doing for the last month, and this has been extremely, extremely helpful because it's been a safe place to play around in. Now, let's get back to the slides. <laughs> slideshow, play from the current slide. Okay, so we had a demo. This was the backup slide in case stuff didn't work. Uh, so about the cloud events experience. 
this greatly simplified our uh, design process. We didn't have to do any encoding ourselves, any decoding. Uh, we have SDKs in uh, most languages. Uh, some Lambdas were written in Golang, some were in Python, and this allowed us exactly that flexibility. It also comes with same defaults. Uh, what really helped was exactly the event type, which is a top-level property, so we can filter by it. And other automations can very quickly say, yeah, I'm not interested in that event, just give me commit, just give me uh, issue comments. And again, Cloud Events does not restrict what you put in data at all. It's just adding same defaults, same values to help you around that. As you've seen, I haven't talked that much about Cloud Events. They're here, they're boring. You can just use them because don't design your own JSON, don't design your own data structures because you're going to get issues. And now we actually have something that's focusing on interoperability. That said, there are some best practices and there are some things you should consider, and for that, you have Clemens. Thank you very much. You landed exactly on time. <laughs> that is really great. Okay, so, um, is it not working? Of course, no, it's not working. Okay, next. So, okay, you will be my clicky. I will be right, your clicky. Go back to that side. Great, so my name is Clemens. Uh, I work for Microsoft, it's not a startup. Um, and uh, I work uh, in the messaging and eventing team. We own Service Bus, Event Grid, Event Hubs, Relay, and we also own standardization in that space, which means we're engaged in CNCF Cloud Events. We're also engaged in several industrial vertical standards, and we're and I'm the technical and the chair of the technical committee for AMQP and Oasis. Um, so a few architectural considerations. Um, one of the things that you should like to take away from the demo, if I can say that, is standardization helps because it lets you build an application, one application based on heterogeneous event sources, and lets you handle, display, um, and, and filter events in a, in a common way. You only need one infrastructure. If, those inf if you have these events, in different formats, you have to have a handler and filter, et cetera, for each of the event types. And here we all make them the same. We have a effectively simple model. We have the, the minimal set of, of things to treat all those events alike, and that's why standardization makes sense. So, next slide. So let's go in and think briefly, and this come, guess, goes into the best practices section, what events are. Um, and, and how they're different from messages, because that's a very important architectural concern. One of the things that is, there's a slippery slope here, and you sh uh, we just want to make you aware of that. Events are not messages in the sense of telling someone something to do, and they're not RPC. It's not the same thing. We're designing for a very particular subset of messages. So, a event carries a fact. It carries something that just has happened. What you just saw in that demo is in GitHub, you did something, you committed something, and now actions happen based on that that just happened. They propagate through a system. The great thing about those facts is because they, prescribe, they describe a thing that has already occurred, you can go and fan them out to everybody, and you can go and write them down, and you can put them into a log, and you can go and replay them. That's different from the intent from a message which you sent to someone with a job of do something particular. So we're, we're just reporting things out. So there's some principles for events, there's principles for PubSub, and that's also what we have in mind when we design these things. We have a notion of a type. We have the notion of a source, where do things come from, and notions of a subject, what is this event about, and all of those help you to filter out messages that you're interested in. You publish events into space, and then you may have subscribers who are interested in particular events who are enabling subscribing to those. And some of the principles are, publishers don't currently know who subscribed. You might publish an event, but there's no subscriber for it, and that's okay. But there may also be 100 subscribers to it, and that's also okay. And middleware typically helps you dealing with that. And this event flow is generally unidirectional, which means you send messages, you send those events out, 
and there's no response path because you don't expect anybody to do based on that event. But they enable really interesting scenarios. They enable extension of, a, um, of an existing application with new functionality without you telling that new functionality to do something. I'll give you a brief example that I always use for eventing, um, which is something that works on, for instance, the blob store that we have in, um, in Azure. The Azure Blob Store can raise an event that's called Blob Created. And you can hook on to the Blob Created event with Cloud Events 1 point, uh, 0 0.1 today uh, via Event Grid. You can hook a handler. So now you can go and have an application go and send raw pictures from a camera, let's say even raw format pictures from a camera or JPEGs into that Blob account. You can now turn that into a photo store because you can hook up this block to the block created event. The application goes, looks at the image, and first, if it's a raw picture, converts it with default settings into a JPEG. Now you have a JPEG. Now you can have another event, which looks at the subject, sees that there's a JPEG in there, and now goes and creates five thumbnails for different sizes and stores them into a different account. You can have another hook that's also reacting on the event, which goes and takes that image and runs it through some AI classification mechanism, which goes and creates tags. And you store those tags into a index database. That index database now may go, go and raise an event as well. You go and hook, that, hook, hook up to that, and then you can go with that, react to that event and import that into your uh, news, newsroom image database, which you can go select from current pictures of the sports game that's currently happening, and you already have that pre-tagged, and you already have the source to the original picture and to all the thumbnails. And you have done nothing other than reacting to events. You haven't told anybody to do something, but everybody is just reacting and building functionality on top of it as an extension. It's extension programming. It's extension-driven programming effectively. You drive events, drive the functionality. You don't tell anybody to do it, but Applications react on things that are happening. Next. Next. OK. So, so they're deceptively similar. Messages that tell you to do something, I will assign you a job, versus events that tell you something that happened. Messages carry events. Events carry facts. Um, there are consequences to that. There are architectural consequences to that, and there's also infrastructural consequences to this. For instance, messages typically live in queues, or often live in queues, because you want one party to pick up that one message because you want that job to be done once. An event typically runs on a pop up system because you want to tell something about that happened, and then they can go and decide whether they want to do something. And very often, you will find that messages and events are happening in systems in a combined fashion. And you will also find that you will use multiple infrastructures for those. If you have streams of events, you might use Kafka because you want to go and pull those events to a place to go and do and analyze them. And because they're facts and things that are happening and they won't be changing anymore, and the context won't be changing anymore, you can also scroll back and forth in that history. Then you have event routers, like we have one in Grid, that goes and take an event and push it out because there's no context required between those events and send them to a handler like a Lambda or an Azure function. And then you have proper message queues which give you the competing consumer model that you need for assigning work. So those things are different. And what we did in Cloud Events, we picked the event piece and how can we go and deal with, this, with these unidirectional messages? And how we can, can we make those look the same? We explicitly scoped out the messaging aspects. And we might, in a different work stream, still get to that problem of, how, of whether we want to unify that. But Cloud Events is not that. Next. Next. OK. So there's stuff that, is, that you will not, not find specifically because of that in Cloud Events. There's no two attribute. We don't tell you where that, cloud, where that message should be sent to because we assume pops up. We tell you where that message comes from. There's also no reply to because 
we're directing this into space and we don't even know that anybody would reply we have no, because we have no expectations of reply. This is not a job we're expecting any replies to. We're basically just telling any subscriber who likes that something happened. So there's no reply to. Which means that Cloud Events is also not there to go and model your RPC exchanges. At least not in the standard way. The envelope is suitable for it, no doubt. But that's not a design point of cloud events. Because, and, and, and when I say envelope, there's a slippery slope here because there's prior art that we also didn't, and I'm not going to mention it, um, but we, we didn't want to go on the slippery slope to write the universal JSON, everybody's envelope format, but we wanted to build something that's specific for events. And then topic Q, also the place where you go and, pl and put that event is also not in the message or in the event. So you don't have a notion of the infrastructure piece that's accepting that event. And the reason why we don't have that is because we assume that events will be forwarded. That events will travel over a long route of forwarders that they might go, come from a, um, might come over HTTP, might then land in a queue, might then be stored in a, in a database, might then come out of the database to be sent to someone else. And you know, the, whoever sent that, published that event initially to what artifact, doesn't matter. Because we assume that those events, those captures of things that happened will travel and will probably be archived for um, a very long time. Next. And, uh, and then lastly, and then we already get to the Q&A section, uh, there's a few things that we have avoided so far, and, and they may raise some, some questions, and that is um, around security spe specifically, because that's something that was raised as a thing, and we said, let's new not do that. There have been many, many different, uh, many, many uh, um, uh, efforts for standardization where um, before things were done, people were trying to tackle specifically these problems, signatures, end-to-end -end encryption for a messaging standard, and they ended up sinking the ship just because the, of the inherent complexity. So we, I, I have insisted, and, and a lot of people have then ended up agreeing, uh, luckily, to say, let's get 1.0 done first, and then let's go and, and think about how, what security and how we go and apply security. We know that eventually we have to go and get there, um, but I think that's a break, bigger discussion and one that also overlaps with things that we have in other areas, like in AMQP, where we do you know, full-on messaging, um, where we need to have mechanisms that are similar. So, for instance, when you start thinking about how to do signatures in an event, which you want, you want to have... Ultimately, we all want to have uh, the ability to go and sign an event and make sure that the event we get over here is the same that was published over there. And you should be able to, to sign that. The question is, how does, how, where do you get the signing key? Who assigns the signing key? How do you get the signing key? If you have a pub sub system, you publish to a publishing point, and now all the subscribers, you can go and subscribe to it. How does the subscriber get that signing key? And when that signing key rolls, which it will, how does that subscriber get that new signing key? How can you tell when you put an event into Kafka and you made a, make a forever log and now you can scroll four months into the past, how do you know the signing key for the event that was for, posted four months ago? If you put that into a database and you see an event that was posted six years in the past, and there have been 500 key rolls, how do you get that key to validate the signature of that thing that was there five, 500 rolls ago, six years ago? That's not trivial. That actually requires quite a bit of infrastructure, quite a bit of protocol, and you can think about all those things, and you can think about approaches to this, but this is not the time to go and deal with it. Um, and, and I believe that we need to have those kinds of key vaults and we need to have those kinds of protocols to go and deal with those, but it's, it's probably not only cloud events problem to go and solve. Um, then, you know, once you, go, once you think about, you know, key distribution, it's also who gets access to those keys and why, and what is the identity space for this? 
So that gets you further down the line and ultimately you get to the point of identity federation first, then you need to go and figure out how to have authorization for whatever the key vault is, then you need to have a notion of how that key vault is managing those things, um, and uh, then have uh, a way to go and correlate um, that key vault to event streams, which means that key vault really needs to be able to store very many keys for you know, periods of time, and you need to be able to go and say, I have an event from five years ago, and now I need to have the key for it. So that's all doable, but it's not, not something that we can go and just solve right now. So that's future work. End-to-end -end encryption is exactly the same problem because you also need to, have, need to have key material. It's just harder because encryption keys degrade faster in this world. Because we have, since we're doing datagrams, and we have not the ability to go and negotiate session keys because there's no other party, we basically have to go and broadcast, and we have to, we have to encrypt datagrams for broadcast, which means the encryption keys degrade very, very fast through use. We have to roll them more often, which means we now need to have a key store, which lets you, will let us also, again, same, same problem, um, get at historical keys fast, and then the question, how does that work? Again, something that's doable. I think that's a job that we all need to go and, and figure out how to go and do, but it's nothing for cloud events only to solve because MQP also has that problem. Um, and that's... And then, you know, without even looking into algorithms and algorithm rolling and, and all of those other, other concerns that have to do with configuration, right? Now, I sign with a SHA-3, and SHA-3 gets, goes out of fashion because eventually it will, and then, you know, how do I replace that? How do I indicate this? I need to have that in the message somehow, some indicators of what algorithms I've been using to go and create the signature. Same goes for encryption. Um, so that's all stuff that we will eventually get to. Um, and there are some other things um, uh, on the agenda which are similar, like we, Doug and I just discussed uh, earlier schemas, which is a similar problem. Like, what does our schema store look like? Because there will be schemas and you will, will be able, will want to look them up. Um, Apache Atlas is a, is a project which uh, might be helpful in that, in that regard. Um, but again, there we need to have a common API um, definition, um, and we don't have that yet. Okay, so that's that. We have uh, four minutes left for questions, if you have any. JWE. Yes, so the J... Yeah, so the question is the JWT, the JSON Web Token, uh, solves some of those concerns? Yes, it does. Um, it, so th there's a whole JOSI, JSON uh, 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 object signature and encryption set of specs that are RFCs now, uh, with, uh, where my colleague Mike Jones also contributed to. Um, and they hail from effectively equivalent standards from the XML world. Um, and yes, yeah, so there are some components that are solved there, um, but it's not in entire suite. It doesn't address the store or the vault or any of those things. So yeah, it, it defines some metadata elements that you can use for this, but it's not a, it's not a complete solution. Next question. The question is whether Project Orleans has an integration with this. I, I, haven't, I, haven't, I have not had any specific discussion about this with those guys, but we're early in the sense in that we haven't locked on a version that anybody can really ship. So we tried to get there very quickly, and then um, we certainly at Microsoft have the intent to go and standardize on cloud events, which means we currently have a native format for EventGrid. All the other services are publishing through EventGrid. And we want to go and switch that format over to uh, cloud events because it now has natively everything we need. So cloud events is winning, you uh, Cloud events is winning. Well, cloud events is certainly something that we want to use. And there's other providers um, who are also want to use it. Um, so I don't know what winning means, but the goal is that we, we all create a common basis to go and do events, and um, if that becomes popular, we're all happy. 
You're welcome. So the question is, um, since signature and encryption, all those things are not there, do you think it's ready to take on critical business data, GDPR data, et cetera? That's a discussion we've had. And so my, the answer to that, and we've had that in the context of the discussion about the, cl the claim check pattern. You should, since, you should always assume that the data that you put into a cloud event gets broadcast. So when you make an announcement out of a CRM app that a shipping address has changed, you should never, no matter whether it's signed or encrypted, you should never include that address. Because you should go in and have a reference that's good enough to understand the context of what you're subscribing to. And then you should have a URL, and that URL should point to the place where you can go and obtain the data. Because then you, you walk up to that, point, to that place, and you can go and obtain with your rights as the consumer, you can go and obtain that data. So think of cloud events as an alerting mechanism that something has changed, but it doesn't necessarily tell you exactly everything about what has changed. And if you have pri privacy-related data, the privacy-related data should stay where it is. And you should basically just point to it rather than, than uh, include it. Well, thank you very much. Have a good show.